Right. Well, let's see if this is going to work then. Hello. Well, that's a start. It's working. Um, audio check. One, two, one, two. Yep. Okay, cool. Well, that's a good start. Let's see if it continues. We're now hooked up to a nice powerful laptop. We're now we're hooked up via the ethernet to the internet connection. So hopefully we shouldn't get any dropouts. I do apologize for the massive sun glare, but it is an unnaturally horribly warm day here in the UK. And despite the fact that I have put up literal sails in this uh, conservatory. It's still pretty darn warm. I've got the windows open, got the door open, got the sails up. And uh, yeah, it's just about tolerable. So if you start to see me uh, take on a little bit of a sheen, that'll be why. Now, as you might guess from the video description, this is a trial for a live stream format that if it works will happen at the end of each month and that is to try and split up the patreon dry docks um, a little bit so we don't have the well it would probably end up being about six or plus hours so um there's that yeah so the the, the patreon dry dock for this uh weekend i think is quote unquote only about three and a half hours um uh, but the way that's being done is that on Sunday you'll see the release of the Patreon Dry Dock which has all the historical questions as I call them and here I have all of the uh, slightly more alternate history questions i.e. the ones that can't really be researched because well the events involved didn't actually happen. Um, so I'm going to try and go through these here and then once we've got to the point of finishing these, we will of course start taking questions from the chat. So, let's see how we get through these. The first question is from Robert, and unsurprising, it's an alternate timeline question. Uh, the question is that, assuming that somehow uh, the British discover that the Japanese are building the Yamatos, and they also learn about the German plans for the H class. With this data being completely indisputable and both Axis powers refusing to confirm or deny anything, the USA and Britain decide to pool resources into designing a massive counter plan. The United States will provide any armament, fire control systems, etc., while the UK will design hull and superstructure. They will both combine their expertise on power plants and radar technology. I'm liking this one. Ultimately, as this cooperative warship is designed and refined, both countries will task their shipyards to produce the vessel in large batches. So, what type of ship will they decide upon, and what would be its generic specifications? Wow. Okay. That's, that's going to be pretty darn terrifying. So, they know at this point that the... Yamatos exist, so we talk. We, we know what the Yamato specs are. They're going to want to match that. I suspect if it's going to be in the lines of the USA providing armament and fire control mostly, while the US, uh, while the UK mostly does, does hull and superstructure. Um, yeah, you're going to be looking at. Well, we, we know that they were speculating on, on ships north of 100,000 tons in 1945, and they were ruled out not because dry, there weren't docks that couldn't build them in the UK, but they were ruled out because there weren't naval facilities to support them. But assuming this is sort of the, uh, the Manhattan Project of the late 1930s, I think we'd probably see something approaching the lines of, if you imagine a Vanguard hull extremely scaled up and with the armor thickness cranked up massively you'd be best advised to grab some US higher pressure boilers 
for the speed. And yeah, so armament wise, radar radar wise, you definitely want UK radars if this is the late 1930s going into the early 1940s. I suspect, given the sheer scale, the slab sided armor of a Vanguard style thing, maybe with an inclination, an inclined external belt like uh, Montana, but using British uh, face hardened armor would probably be the way to go. And yeah, I mean, between Vanguard's general hull form and some US high pressure turbines, bearing in mind what the US was already thinking about with their potential long tanner design, you're probably looking at something along the lines of the Montana in terms of main battery armament, so 12, 16 inch, 50 caliber guns. You're probably looking at maybe a 16 inch inclined um, British uh, face hardened belt. Propulsion is going to be probably, they're going to easily hit 33, 34 knots at that point if they combine the best of both worlds um, with that kind of scale and size. Secondary battery, I'm going to be a bit controversial. I'm actually going to suggest they take a British secondary battery, with, but with Mark 37 fire control directors, specifically the twin 4.5 inch guns they stuck on the carriers and the refit Queen Elizabeths. I think that would serve them slightly better on this scale than twin 5 inch 38s. It's tempting to go with four quads, but given the problems that they were experiencing with the quads for the King George V's, and given that the US has, well, no thanks to the Bureau of Ordnance, but at least does have a functioning triple 16 inch 50, then you're probably going to be better off using those. Um, yeah, that Sean Mack mentions no 5 inch 54s. Unfortunately, it's just too early for that. Um, and the 4.5 inch guns, they would allow you to fit maybe a few more of them on and they're probably slightly better anti-surface weapons. Of course, you will have a Queen Anne's Mansion superstructure and with that kind of scale, you've got more than enough space for radar and such like. So they probably have to, well, probably can ditch the aircraft. Um, yeah, a fleet of those wandering the oceans would be quite amusing. The Hand of Ray asks, assuming Japan by some miracle was not horrifically losing the Pacific War by 1944, how would Shinano have fared if it was finished as a fleet carrier and how would it stack up to its contemporaries? It's always going to suffer the problem of a conversion. All conversions are inefficient. Uh, you look at the relative displacement of the Yorktown and... Uh, Lexington classes or the relative displacement of Shikaku or Hiryu, sorry, Zuikaku versus Akagi and Kaga. And, or even to, that, yeah, to be honest, Ark Royal versus Courageous, Glorious and Furious. And you can see a purpose design carrier can maintain significantly larger air group per tonnage than a conversion. So although Shinano would be absolutely immense, it's not going to have the kind of air group you might otherwise think it would and this is if it's a if it's finished as a fleet carrier obviously historically they tried to finish it as a fleet repair ship so yeah but as, assuming with assuming they're trying to finish it as a fleet carrier other weaknesses it suffers is like Karga, it's converted from a battleship like eagle for that matter so it's not going to have the speed that you're otherwise going to be seeing from battle cruiser conversions or purpose fleet carriers. I suspect given the way it was set up, the internal volumes and such like, and extrapolating a little bit from that, you could probably relatively reliably run an air group of 90 to 100 off of it, which is large, but considering that you're looking at an Essex class, which can run roughly the same air group on about half the displacement it's not actually that brilliant <laughs> um how would it have fared in 1944 not not tremendously well i mean it's got the limitations on speed so it's not going to be quite as good at operating its full aircraft um complement and even if japan isn't horrifically losing the war by 1944 it's still going to be badly losing the war so, um, yeah, it, it's going to be in a bit of a losing fight there because Japan doesn't really have that many functioning carriers left by that point. And even if they do, 
they don't have that many functioning good aircraft carrier pilots. So I, sus I suspect you'll probably see something similar, and that, assuming a US submarine doesn't get it, you'll probably see something similar to uh, what happened with Yamato, which is it'll be one big target that loads of carriers will launch strikes against, and then we'll compete for the honor of trying to sink it. Um, uh, Leops 1984, supposing that Frank Jack Fletcher manages to play USN service politics better and isn't shuffled off to the side after Eastern Solomons, how would he have done as a fleet commander in place of either Halsey or Spruance, both in general and specifically at Philippine Sea and or Leyte Gulf? Philippine Sea, it's... It will be easy to do worse, but it'd be difficult to do better than Philippine Sea, than the US historically did at the Philippine Sea. So... He's a good admiral. I don't think he's going to make any major mistakes, but as it's difficult to improve on the slaughter that was the Battle of the Philippine Sea. Battle of Leyte Gulf, though, and you can probably see where this is going, if he'd been in charge instead of Halsey um, of the, the fast carrier group, that could have ended very differently because whilst the Battle of Cape Engano was trumpeted as, oh yes, the final destruction of the Japanese carriers, blah, 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 we kind of all know it, it, it was more a bit of a... It was even more of a turkey shoot than the actual Mariana's turkey shoot. Um, now, imagine the counter scenario. Fletcher is not quite as impulsive, impulsive as Halsey. Doesn't go charging off. Maybe detaches a, a, a couple of carriers or an escorts to, to see off the Japanese... And then along comes Yamato, Nagato, Aruna, and uh, Congo, and all their escorts, and they come cruising through the San Bernardino Strait, only to find half the US's fast battleships and a lot of very angry aircraft waiting for them, with um, the escorts and Taffy 3 sitting off to one side, giggling madly to each other. I think that would be... Uh, that would be quite a, quite a greater achievement for the uh, U.S. fast carrier forces as compared to, um, yeah, as opposed to en Cape Engano. And you've got to bear in mind on top of that that think about how much punishment Yamato actually took with significantly weaker escorts. You've now got four capital class targets plus a much heavier escort group. With the best will in the world, a short notice strike scrambled even from the fast carrier task force or how, however much of it is left after sections are dispatched to Cape Engano probably isn't going to down the Yamato or many of the Japanese capital units in time they're certainly going to do damage but you think about just when the Japanese were spotted it's almost certainly going to come down to a surface engagement it's going to be a very interesting surface engagement because um there's going to be massive ongoing aerial assaults whilst the Iowas, etc., blast away. So it's going to look spectacular, and there's going to be wonderful photos. But, yeah, th that will actually be a full-on surface engagement, which actually means we get the Iowas actually having the Iowa versus Yamato battle that everybody always argues about. So we actually get that settled properly, which is good. Um... I have no idea how you pronounce that. That's this. I'm sorry, but this name looks a bit more like a, an eye test board than an actual name. A guy called Rafal with a very strange surname asks, how would modern ships fare under extreme close range fire from 19th century ships up to the warrior? Um, if we're talking about modern warships, assuming that they're not able to shoot back initially because it's some kind of surprise attack, Against the later ships, actually not brilliantly. If they're at age of sail broadside ranges, bear in mind that sort of the 68 pounder, for example, that was the standard armament on Warrior, was fitted to multiple other Royal Navy warships before Warrior was launched. So it was kind of a bit of a fleet bait, uh, a fleet wide weapon at that point. When it was tested against Warrior's uh, armor, it 
couldn't quite penetrate it, or maybe it could, depending on which test you believe. It seems to come down largely to the quality of the iron. But Warrior's armor was four and a half inches of iron backed onto 18 inches of teak. And most modern warships, you're probably lucky to get an inch of hull steel, and usually less. Now, obviously, modern hull steel is a lot stronger than the iron that Warrior's armor is made out of, but it's not 500% stronger. So... At absolute point blank range, yeah, they'll probably start poking holes in ships, which are quite, which is going to be quite irritating. Um, of course, the the flip side to that is that these kinds of broadsides are mostly solid shot, and modern warships don't tend to have too many vital systems in the outer parts of their hull. So, without the explosive component and early 19th century shells are just going to bounce off and explode you're not going to do fatal damage quickly enough before they wind the, a four and a half inch gun or five inch gun or a 20 millimeter phalanx around and just rip tear and tear into the the ship so yeah the funniest part actually would be for something like a carrier because a carrier is just so massive you could blaze away for probably half an hour with a first rate and yeah you'd probably make the side look a little bit like swiss cheese but whether or not they'd actually notice that much is open to question uh, roger poker points out yes what grape shot would do to the radar and fire control radars the main problem there unless you're going after a small ship well relatively speaking small ship like an escort is that well the radar is going to be all the way up there and the cannons are all the way down there so unless some enterprising person is cranking them right up somehow um it's probably not gonna not gonna be too pretty Jeffrey Cook, if Germany and Japan somehow gone to war 1v1 in 1914, was the German Navy capable of sailing around the world and doing what the Russian fleet could not? And could von Spee's forces have held out and defended Germany's colonies in the meantime? Uh, assuming that this is a, as a 1v1, so this isn't a world war scenario. Ooh. Von Spee's forces are not going to hold out in Tsingtao. No way, no way, no, no how. Um, the Japanese have, well, they've got the Kawachis, they've got as dreadnoughts, they've got the Satsumas as semi-dreadnoughts. They've kind of got Congo, it's just coming up, working up. The another Congos are also coming online. And they've got armoured cruisers, pre-dreadnoughts, and all sorts of other wonderful stuff like that. So, um, yeah, against what Von Spee has, that's going to take about five minutes. There's a very good reason Von Spee left Sing Tao. Yes, he knew about HMS Australia and the Royal Australian Navy. He was equally acutely aware of just exactly how powerful the Japanese Navy were. And they were a lot closer. <laughs> so he was, yeah. The Sing Tao is not going to hold out. As for whether the Germans can send the rest of the high seas fleet round... If it's 1v1 and we're operating under pure neutrality rules, theoretically, I don't think the Germans could send the entire High Seas Fleet round logistically, but they could probably send around enough of it. The High Seas Fleet in 1914 still has more than enough power to demolish the Japanese fleet in an open gunfight. Assuming that the Japanese give them one, which, to be fair, to the Japanese, they probably would. Um, however, the Anglo-Japanese alliance is in place at this point and even if the british for some reason aren't getting involved they at minimum are not going to let the germans use their ports and supply ships which is going to complicate matters very very uh, much if the germans can stage enough coal replenishment ships and such which they've got a fairly large merchant marine they can probably give it a good solid go they can get enough forces around there and they have enough forces to beat the Japanese. Yes. Whether or not they can pull off that particular feat of logistics is another matter. Although, to be fair, with their much greater number of escorts and cruisers, they're probably not going to be so worried about Japanese torpedo boats. So they'll probably go through the Mediterranean and try and get through the Suez Canal, if they can. And that will save them a whole lot of bother. Um, 
Bill Luster asks, if nuclear propulsion was available 20 to 30 years earlier, i.e. during the 1930s post-treaty construction boom, how would World War II era ships be different if you could redesign them? Um, frankly, the idea of fighting World War II with nuclear-powered capital ships terrifies me beyond all possible reason. <laughs> because, well, as you're probably aware, there were quite a few capital ships and aircraft carriers that went to the bottom of the ocean, some of which in fairly spectacular manner. Um, if it was up to me, I would keep nuclear power, nuclear reactors as far away from World War II capital ships as it was humanly possible to do. Um, I mean, I dread to think what HMS Hood would do to the Denmark Strait <laughs> if you have a ma rear magazine detonation right next to the engineering spaces, which now contain a nuclear reactor. Hmm. Yeah. I also have a feeling some of the Indonesian countries will probably be a lot more vociferous about getting rid of Prince of Wales's wreck. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I, f from an engineering perspective and from a historical perspective, I just I wouldn't. I just wouldn't at all. Um, maybe if I was going to abuse my ridiculous future knowledge, I might stick a few of them in the armoured hangar carriers that the British have, because none of them were sunk, and that would be quite amusing. Um, but yeah, without horribly abusing hindsight to work out exactly which ships were and weren't blown up and sunk, I'd just stay away from the whole idea. Um, although if I was allowed to abuse future hindsight, I kind of want to see what happens if you replace an entire, was entire machinery bank with a massive set of nuclear reactors. Um, and see just how fast you can actually crank those things up to. John Don Hope points out, we have nuclear reactors on the bottom of the ocean. Yes, we do. None of them went to the bottom of the ocean because someone blew up 200 tonnes of high explosive next to them. <laughs> um, so there were a few implosions in submarines, but... Um, Colonel Cheng asks... Uh, an alternate history question. Assuming the early phase of the Battle of the Mediterranean goes very poorly for the Italians, um, so Littorio capsizes at Taranto rather than sinking upright, Caio Dulio suffers a magazine explosion, um, Vittorio Veneto suffers propulsion, uh, propulsion crippling damage as a result of a torpedo hit and gets basically Cape Matapand, etc, etc. Um, that also takes down Julia Cesare, apparently, because she's screening hit, um, them. How does this change in the balance of power in the Mediterranean affect the strategic situation in the Far East? Would the Japanese have still attacked the colonial holdings of European powers in Eastern and Southeast Asia, knowing that much of the Royal Navy is not tied down in the Mediterranean? And would they have dared to attack Pearl Harbor with the British still an immediate threat in their Western flank? They don't have much of a choice. The Americans have said you can't have oil and the only place they can get oil is the Dutch East Indies in any significant quantity. That means they have to go to war or they have to accede to America's demands um, to not to get their oil imports from America back. And they're not likely to do that. They've got a bit of the bit of, bit of a sunk cost fallacy going on in China there. And as I've said before, to get to the Dutch East Indies, you have to take out the Philippines, which means getting the USA involved. If you're going to get the USA involved, pretty much the only chance they've got of anything going their way in the first year or so is to do Pearl Harbor. So they're going to have to do Pearl Harbor. And then when they hit the Dutch East Indies, both from a general strategic point of view and from a specific threat point of view, that's going to get the British involved. They're just going to have to live with it. They're really going to probably rely on Pearl Harbor doing enough damage to keep the USA out of the war and then hope that they can um, take out the Royal Navy at sea with a similar to Pearl Harbor style strike. So yeah, they're, they're still going to go for that. And bear in mind that even if the Italians lose a lot of their heavy cruisers and um, battleships, and such like, then 
they're still going to there's still going to be an Italian Navy there's still going to be an Italian Air Force so that's still going to tie down Royal Navy resources even if it's not the bigger units you've still got the Kriegsmarine to worry about Bismarck Tirpitz the Scharnhorst etc so the Royal Navy is not going to be able to do a full deployment they're going to be able to do a much stronger deployment but it's not going to be full on um, And to answer Joshua Calvert's question, um, making friends with the Dutch for the oil instead? Well, for one thing, that's not really the Japanese style. They like to take things at this point in history rather than get, um, get rather than ask for them or make friends for them. But also, bearing in mind at this point, we're talking about late 1941, the Germans have overrun the Netherlands. The Dutch government's in exile in the UK. The UK relies on the US um, to, for certain supplies and support in the war make, making effort. So I, the UK is going to put a fair bit of, du of pressure on the Dutch government if the Japanese do make those kind of overtures to um, politely decline. Because the last thing Britain wants is to get into an argument with the USA over the Dutch government in exile effectively breaking the US embargo. Uh, so, yeah. Um, Matthew Jones. Let's say you're in charge of naval design in the Royal Navy. The UK signed the Washington-London Treaty, so early 1930s. Um, but you still have your knowledge from the present day and know that other nations are going to cheat on tonnage. Uh, the K King George V's are being designed but you can intervene and make any changes you would like. How would you cheat the system? <laughs> uh, what additions or modifications would you make to get the King George V up to the same displacement as Bismarck? And how would you attempt to hide this to maintain Br British reputation? Um, if they signed up to First London Naval Treaty, I'm going to refuse to sign to s well either if well not refuse to sign up to Second London, but I'm going to pressure them to scrap the 14 inch caliber category i'm going to ask them to um stick with the 15 inch caliber and i'm going to uh, uh, make that request on two bases one most of the pre-existing fleet is 15 inch so we've got 15 inch ships and we've got 16 inch with nelson and rodney it's just going to be really difficult introducing a third caliber um which is it to be honest is a fair point um and also it allows for a certain commonality of supply it so it, it works both ways in in sticking with the 15s now you might see where i'm going with this because then i'm going to get the king george the fist equipped with three triple 15 inch to new design which is going to be um quite fun which is pretty much one of the original design specs I'm also going to rejig the bow, um, get rid of that stupid zero degree elevation um, bow and go with something more like Vanguard's bow. And a bee has gotten into oars. Oh well. What on earth is it doing? Oh, hopefully it'll calm down. Anyway, um, what else am I going to do? I'm with the Great as a respect to the designs of the 5.25 inch gun, I'm going to uh, scrap the idea of putting that as a secondary battery. It's going to cause no end of trouble. I'm instead going to go with the uh, 4.5 inch again. Um, so probably something more like the Queen Elizabeth's refit and the Renown's refit with uh, 10 twin 4.25s at uh, 4.5 inch guns with five turrets per side. In terms of racking up the overall tonnage, but not um, somehow making it obvious, what I'd probably do is have your single thickness main deck, and then I would leave out any kind of splinter decks where possible. Um, and launch them that way that will save a few hundred tons 
and probably similarly with the turrets i'm going i might i don't know how i i wouldn't put in counterweights necessarily but I, for things like the roof armor i would carefully make sure that i could manufacture some thicker roof plates maybe th some thicker side plates as well as i say the splinter deck armor etc and put those all to one side and and things like this so although the ship's probably still going to launch over t overweight relative to the um treaty limits it's going to be probably overweight but enough that i can hide that and pretend it's thirty-five thousand tons obviously it's not it's probably going to be 36 37 at that point and then when war were declared and war the treaty system gets torn up i just magically happen to have this bunch of thicker armor plates for the turrets and a bunch of splinter deck armor which quickly shove back in and i have my 15 inch armed king george v that are probably pushing forty thousand tons and then everyone will suddenly realize why those ships seem to ride incredibly high when they were initially launched i'd probably keep most of the torpedo protection system flooded at the same time just to weigh them down to the point that they looked like they were vaguely on their waterline um where else are we looking at Uh, Brian Smith, what do you think the results would be if you took all the other navies in the world combined at their peaks during World War II against the US Navy at the end of World War II? Um, ooh. Now, if you put that in a pitched battle, that gets very interesting because if you're talking about at their very peak, you're talking about the end, end of war Royal Navy in its entirety you're talking about what was the peak of the japanese navy is probably late 19 mid 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 42 before midway maybe even before coral sea when they've still got the full force of the kido butai and yamato's just come into service kriegsmarine oh now that's a hard one because the kriegsmarine loses so many ships in the norwegian campaign obviously it gains bismarck later on but that's to Bismarck and Terps are pretty much all they get after that and a few handful of light ships so you're probably talking about the Kriegsmarine at circa March 1940 and the Italians probably uh, well actually the Italians probably 1943 just before the surrender because at that point they've got three Littorio class and they they now get can get a bunch of oil It'd be a heck of an interesting fight, but going over that mentally, I, the U.S. Navy is probably still going to win. I mean, there's there's just going to be the sheer interoperability problems between those four major fleets and all the others. That's going to be a major problem just to start with. But separate to that, yeah, the the even all the British carriers put together. I mean, that's a substantial force that could have hurt the U.S. Navy quite a bit. But with the Japanese carriers being mid-1942 spec, I say it's going to be a vicious fight, but if you line them all up one side against the other, the US still has plenty of... Um, it has too many flight decks, basically, if, if you line up all the Essexes, um, Enterprise, and all the Independences, etc., um, then that's I mean there's going to be a glorious and massive gunfight in the middle of it because the aircraft will be so busy slaughtering each other that the, the gun lines will probably close but the US Navy is just too big at that point uh, unless somehow the combined non-US fleets somehow get a surprise attack in Bryce Stockler asks if the First World War ended with a central power victory by the late 1930s could the German Navy have surpassed the navies of their new potential enemies in the event of war around this time would it be enough to combat another blockade? Um, no, because Great Depression. I mean, okay, Germany's not going to be quite, quite as badly as it would have been with its uh, wartime losses, but still Great Depression is going to be a problem. And although Germany has a lot of industrial power, as we saw in the 1910s, it couldn't outbuild the UK. 
and its potential enemies in the 1930s, assuming that it somehow wins. Well, it's still going to be the UK and the Americans are going to be looking at them very interesting with a great deal of interest. Um, so, yes, that's going to be... No, the, Germany in the 1930s isn't going to outbuild the USA in the 1930s, much less the USA and the British trying to rebuild their navy in the 1930s. Uh, James Sean Moore, you've just won the lottery. Decide to build a replica of a warship, just much smaller, i.e. less than 100 feet. So a scale mod, big scale model. Which warship would you recreate? Hmm. Depends which lottery I've won. If I've won the Euro millions, I've got hundreds of millions of pounds to play with. If I've got the, if I win the national lottery, I might only have a few million. Um, If I was going to be completely extravagant, I'd go with Thunderchild, Warspite, or Dreadnought. Um, if I was going to build a hundred foot long replica seriously, as in I had, had, as if I legitimately had actually won the lottery, I'd probably build a big destroyer. Because it wouldn't be too far off scale in the first place, and something like a tribal Fletcher gearing, something like that, you could probably turn that into a legitimate kind of internally, because it's only an external replica. You could probably turn that into a legitimate houseboat, and who doesn't want to go tearing around in a like a half scale World War II destroyer, whilst it also is your home. <laughs> In fact, in that case, I might actually use one of the battle class because then you could strip off some of the rear AA armament and have a car deck. <laughs> oh, hello, B. Um, doo -doo -doo. Mason asks, replace the Japanese force at the Battle of Java Sea with a German equivalent and replace the German force at the Battle of Barents Sea with a Japanese equivalent. How does this change e each battle and do the Axis fare any better or worse? The Battle of the Barents Sea is going to go horribly horribly worse for the Axis. The Battle of the Barents Sea was bad enough with the weather conditions and everything without getting lightly built Japanese warships into the mix. Um, plus they have no radar, so yeah, that's going to be a bit of a one-sided slaughter. Um, Josh Thomas Moore, no, the child crying out is next door neighbours. Um, the only, main reason you can hear them as I say is because I've had to have all the doors and windows open to... Um, in an attempt not to boil. As far as the Battle of the Java Sea with a German equivalent, that's a more interesting one. Because you're basically putting the Admiral Hippers in there, but the Admiral Hippers don't have the long lances, which did some some damage. And the Japanese the German destroyers aren't as good as the Japanese unfortunately so actually I think I think actually in both cases the Axis does worse the 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 Admiral Hippers I can't see them outperforming the Japanese cruisers at Java Sea the destroyers definitely aren't going to outperform the, the Japanese destroyers and at the Barents Sea well the weather's probably going to get half the Japanese ships let alone anybody else uh, I do actually, Animal 16365, I do actually have an aircon unit on its way. Um, and to be fair, it is getting a bit cooler now. Captain Landlocked, somewhat akin to ship versus ship comparisons, who would win an Admiral's duel between Michael de Reuter and Sir Francis Drake? Both a naval battle and a fencing battle. It depends for the for the fencing for the fencing battle fencing match. I would probably say, say Drake because he's more of a pirate who happened to be given naval command than he is a full on naval officer. So I'd expect him to fight with a lot less honor. <laughs> um, he's probably the kind of person who, in a fencing match, the minute it looks like he might be losing, will just pull out a pistol and blast you in the face. So he probably wins that one. In an actual naval engagement. I think it's going to depend on the scale. If it's a 1v1, it's going to be very difficult to call, but 
I'd be tempted to edge it just slightly in Drake's favour because he is so ridiculously aggressive and determined to, to capture things. If it's a, any kind of squadron or fleet scale engagement, then I would actually put my money quite heavily on De Reuter because Drake's good at commanding raids, he's good at commanding small small ship actions, single ship actions, and maybe small, small squadron actions. But there's a reason Lord Howard of Effingham, um, I think, yes, was in charge during the Armada rather than Drake. And Drake didn't exactly cover himself with a massive amount of dignity in that. He fought very well and fought very hard when he had to, but he was rather determined to keep making off with prizes. So I think he'd be much more easily distracted, whereas de Reuter is probably much better at staying focused at an actual full-scale naval battle. So I'd give I'd give that fight the the large scale naval fight to De Reuter. Um, Daryl Smith asks, in relation to the old joke about heaven is where the French are cooks, the Italians are the lovers, the Germans the engineers, the British run the government. British running the government are heaven, okay. And hell is where the British are cook, the Germans are the lovers, the French are the engineers, and the Italians run the government. If you were to build a fleet in the first half of the 20th century and apply this heaven or hell scenario to Japan, USA, England, Germany, Russia, France, Italy, etc., when it comes to design, leadership, gunnery, armor, crew quality, etc., how would your dream fleet and fleet from hell lineups be composed? Hmm. Um... If you want a fleet from hell with that lineup, I would say Italian leadership, Russian design, um, Italian gunnery, if we're adopting their shell quality control aspects, um, Russian armor, uh, crew quality, yeah, that's a... Crew quality, I'll go with the... I'll go with the Japanese, mainly because they just beat their crew and don't feed them enough. German machinery, definitely. Um, British turret design. Ah, yes. British quad turret design with French 15-inch guns in them. Because then the guns will explode and the turrets will jam. Um, and then I put Buord in, front, in, in charge of the actual putting all the ships together. And of course, yeah, Bu um, American torpedo. Stick some torpedo launchers in there as yeah, America um, Bjord American torpedo launchers. Uh, to be honest, that, I'd be surprised if that kind of fleet even made it out of harbour before rolling over and or exploding. Um, yeah. <laughs> Don't worry, we're almost there. Um, Da, 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 da. Where are we? Stuart asks, given congressional limits on procurement for the US Navy in the 1910s, how would you have opted to design a standard class of super dreadnoughts with the benefit of hindsight? And could these ships have been preserved as capable frontline units into the World War II era with appropriate modernization and rebuilding? Or would funding limits have relegated US battleships of this period to shore bombardment regardless? Um... Yeah, how am I going to do that? The main thing I would do with the standard class battleships, to be completely honest with you, is I would change the hull form, and this is probably going to necessitate dropping a turret, but I would change the hull form, drop a turret, and put in some more engines. If I'm using the benefit of hindsight, then, yeah, that, that's what I would do. I would probably point to the Queen Elizabeth's, and say to Congress, look, this is the future of battleships. We can't afford to be that much slower, um, especially with every, with you point at the Japanese as well, because I mean, okay, the Fusos aren't yet built, but they're building the Congos. And so I would say we need, we need faster ships. And I think that would be the main change because armor wise, the standards are still competitive in World War II. 
Gun wise, certainly once you get the later marks of the 14 inch gun, they're still pretty solid, especially with the newer shells. It's the speed that really lets them down. The speed it means they're relegated to second line duties, much like the, the R class are, except in emergencies. The Queen Elizabeths, their contemporary, and the main reason they see a lot of frontline duty is because they can go that little bit faster. So if I have to drop a one of the turrets, probably the rear super firing triple on most of the standards, lengthen the hull a little bit and um, stick in more engine power so I can maybe go 25, 26 knots, that will be my main change. Yeah, I think that that would be pretty much how I do it. You could, I suppose, go for the Nevada style and save some weight by putting a couple of twins on top, but realistically, you, you get a lot more complexity and you only get one extra gun. So, why bother? And to be honest, the 2 4 one half triple layout looks pretty good. Um, da, 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 da. Congressional limits, that's the one we just did. Um, Leops 1984. If Shinano survives the war relatively intact, that sounds like Shinano month, um, either in original battleship form or converted CV form, what do the Americans do with her? Um, blow her up at Operation Crossroads. <laughs> that's That, that basically would, is the US answer to almost anything they get that's of any significant size from the Axis. Um, it'd actually be a good, to be honest, it'd actually be a fairly good test as well, considering that the biggest carrier type object they blew up at Crossroads was the Saratoga. Um, Shinano being somewhat more heavily built would be a good way of giving them a test as to how armoured or semi-armoured carriers might react to a nuclear blast. Um, da -da. Emerald Leafion, if you could make a fleet up of ships that were never actually built or completed, what would it look like? Oh, depends on depends on a number of factors actually, but the biggest factor it's going to depend on is going to be hmm. The biggest factor it's going to depend on be is going to be time. Because there's a whole load of cancel designs around World War One for obvious reasons. There's a whole load of interwar designs that were done for obvious reasons, and and obviously there's one cancel towards the end of World War Two. Hmm. <laughs> I'd have to think about that. M I'd have to think about that more. In fact, Emerald Leafion, if you are watching or if you see this, um, actually, was of course I have no pen. Um, right, okay, I'm going to make a mark there. I'm actually going to come back to that at some point in a longer video because discussing the strengths and weaknesses of never completed but properly designed ships is actually quite interesting. Um, Timo Fiebig asks, how do you think naval combat would look if, for magic reasons, it would be impossible to build guns that could penetrate the armour of an ironclad? I think I answered that question at Patreon dry dock or two ago. It's basically back to the galleon style boarding and ramming things. Uh, <laughs> if you can't penetrate the armour, yeah, it's basically set things on fire or board them or ram them. Those are, those are basically your only, uh, your only options. Um, Admiral, oh, we're nearly there, don't worry, we've got one, two, three, four questions, and then I can start taking questions from the rest of you. So this'll be, this should be fun. Um, I don't know why I'm, yeah. Right, uh, Admiral Tiberius says, it's 1935, and you're in charge of all aspects of ship design, construction, repair, weapons, and new technology in the US Navy. Um, I've got all my modern knowledge. The budget is 20% larger than normal. I remember this because he sent me some rather nice data on how big the US budget was. Um, so the budget is 20% larger than normal until 42 when it goes back to historical level and I'm in the job until 45. What ship designs do you cancel, push forward or redesign and what technology weapon systems do you invest in? What do I scrap? How do I prepare the US for World War II and what do I do during the war? Wow, that's a bit of a, that's a, bit of a question. Um, Hmm. What would I do with all of that? 
Okay, well, I'm not changing the mass build of the Fletchers. I'm probably going to arrange for a number of accidents for people in Buord. Um, I'm going to write to anybody who's vaguely an ally and ask them for some reliable torpedo detonators for the Mark 14s. My and the Mark 15s and the Mark 13s for that matter. Um, what else am I going to do? The thing is, if I do shoot enough people in Buord, then the screw up that led to the I was getting 16 inch 50 Mark 7s is probably not going to happen. So that's going to be interesting because that means the I was then get to use the 16 inch 50s, the older ones. And there's plenty of those lying around, so that's not too bad an outcome. Um, I'd obviously point out the weaknesses in the new US battleships torpedo defenses, get those fixed. There's, if it's 1935, there's not a lot I can do about the Yorktowns. Most of the US cruisers, to be honest, are fine. Um, I might quietly see if I can tweak the Wichita design into something that's maybe a 11, 12,000 tonner that doesn't quite have the same stability issues and get that resolved and then put, put that forward as my um, immediate build wartime cruiser. I mean, obviously you end up with the Baltimores pretty quickly, but starting construction on some enlarged Wichitas in the late 30s will probably go a long way. Um, I say destroyers, the Fletchers are great. Um, five inch 38 guns are fine. They don't need much changing. Um, radar, obviously push for radar quicker if possible. I think light cruisers, again the Clevelands are fine. There's not much much you can fix about those. <laughs> um, battleship design with the South Dakotas I would just go look treaty's over guys um, it's, th th yes there's a certain margin to be said for building capital ships to the treaty displacements but knowing that the treaty system's about to collapse I'd not necessarily go straight for the Iowas but I'd certainly try and stick a few thousand more tons on the South Dakotas get, and get the hulls a bit longer just to make them a bit more habitable and a bit less cramped the biggest changes I'm probably going to make are going to be in carrier design. And I'm probably going to reach into the future knowledge and take what I know is going to happen with the Midway class and the lessons of the war from all sides. And I'm going to press for the Essexes to start being constructed earlier. And I'm also going to press for them not to be armoured hangar carriers like the Royal Navies, but for armoured flight deck carriers. And yes, that's going to re result in a slight reduction in air group, but to be honest, I've got more than enough of them and the air group's still going to be pretty substantial without the armoured hangar. Still going to have plenty of hangar space and volume, etc. And that, that would be what I would... Those would be the main changes I'd make. And obviously just crank up production. I mean, start the Fletcher Swarm so, so quickly. Um, the Alaska's... I don't think 1935. I don't think politically, I mean, I've got control of the budget and the bill, but I don't think politically I could persuade anyone to build the Alaskas early enough. You'd have to be starting on the Alaskas by 37, 38 at the latest to get any m real use out of them. And with the way a lot of the close in naval fights go around Guadalcanal and Savo Island and such like, Putting the Alaskas in those places could just be asking for some pretty high casualty events. Um, I don't think I'd press on with the Alaskas. I'd want more of my mid-teen displacement Super Wichitas and Baltimores, to be perfectly honest. Um, and yeah, with, with Armoured Flight Deck Essexes, that's going to save so many lives. Um, instead of the absolute carnage you get on something like USS Franklin... You're going to have in comes Judy. There goes bombs. Bounce. Oh, there go the bombs. How interesting. Oh, well, someone shoot that down, please. Um, that would be much, much, much better outcome, I think. 
Um, yeah, I mean, the, the, US, the US ship designs in the late 1930s, apart from particular key flaws like the South Dakotas being a bit too cramped, the torpedo defense systems on the battleships not being brilliant, and the, uh, in my opinion, slightly too vulnerable design of US carriers overall otherwise they're fine they've, they've hit their stride the the worst of the problems with u.s destroyer design are mostly coming to an end with the fletcher design being brought together um and yeah maybe the heavy cruisers could use a bit more protection but that outside of that and well getting rid of the of Buord's officers I think, to be honest, that under that paradigm, regardless of how many ships I've got, the entire war is going to look completely different because during the invasion of the Philippines, with all the various uh, US ships, especially the submarines, having functioning torpedoes, the Japanese Navy is going to take a lot more of a hammering just at that point than it does anywhere else. Um, so, yeah, there's that. All right, so that's that one. I've only got three more to go. So John Benson, if the Confederacy had been able to capture Norfolk intact, would it have dramatically affected the balance of naval power, um, i.e. breaking Anaconda, whatever that means, or did the Confederate States Navy lack the personnel and expertise to capitalise on its windfall? They did get a fair bit of stuff out of Norfolk anyway, because it turns out guns don't burn easily. But if they've been able to get it in completely intact, so they get all the stores, all the equipment, and the ships, um, actually, interestingly enough, that means they probably don't get the Virginia anywhere near as early as they otherwise did, because with Virginia, Virginia, I remember, was built on the hulk of Merrimack, which was torched, and instead, in this case, they have a steam frigate, they also have a bunch of ships of the line, for whatever vague use they have. Anaconda was the blockade of the south. Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. Um... I mean, they've, they'll have inherited a fair number of steam-powered ships and, as I say, the ships of the line. And with the supplies and equipment they've got at Norfolk, they could probably make a fairly creditable go at breaking the Union blockade, at least initially. Because the Union Navy... Well, the Union Navy's numerical strength is going to be much reduced. And in that immediate start of the war period without ironclads around in the unions a lot of the unions initial strength of numbers being made up of ships they've converted from various merchant ships they can probably hold some of the ports of the south open for a while but at the end of the day the union just has so much industry i mean obviously with the with the ports open they're going to have more money and more ability to bring in supplies so that's going to also drag the whole thing out longer but the Union A is going to invent the ironclad at some point, which is going to obviate a lot of the advantages they've got from having all these wooden warships around. And the Union is just going to end up outbuilding them one way or the other. It's, um, it's going to be quite spectacular, though, the initial few combats. And just how much of an effect that has is going to be predicated i think on how those initial fights go if um if the union commits a lot of blockading type ships and gets them smashed it's going to take them quite a while to recover from that whereas if they pull back the blockade and husband their ships until they can get the overwhelming strength or ironclad strength they need to shatter the confederate navy that's a different matter entirely of course the confederacy might also um send a bunch of them out as raiders css alabama style so yeah it's probably got a, a margin to extend the war a fair bit but in the end the union's just got crushing industrial strength david blanchard asks um august 1914 and i'm in charge of the grand fleet i can appoint and name your com the commanders who would you charge being choose to be in charge of the battle cruiser fleet who would you choose and why uh, would you choose bt or someone else um well i think i covered this in the last live stream i did about jutland once the battle of the falkland islands has gone on i would put admiral sturdy in charge because i think he makes an excellent squadron commander which is effectively what the battle cruiser fleet is he'd make an awful fleet commander because he has all sorts of weird and wonderful ideas about splits and entrapments but 
sturdy with a decent flag officer is going to be and signals officer is going to be much better at getting those ships home alive and intact than BT was. And as I say, put BT in charge of a, a flanking element of the Grand Fleet and you've got basically the world's best live tripwire. Um, and then finally on the Patreon questions, Tom Harper, 1997, asks, it seems to be less discussed than the more, other more politically impactful sinkings of the Lusitania, but could you outline the situation and circumstances surrounding the sinking of the German Wilhelm Gustloff in 1945? Um, hmm. Yeah, that was a bit of a nightmare, wasn't it? Um... It is something that merits its own video, if nothing else, out of respect for the tragedy that it really represented. But very briefly, the Wilhelm Gustloff was evacuating people in the face of the Russian advance. It was packed with mostly refugees and other non-military personnel. And it ended up being torpedoed by, I believe, a Russian submarine. And obviously going down with a ridiculous loss of life because it was a massive passenger liner packed to the gunnels with people, which is not a pleasant situation at all. At the time, it took a while for the news to filter out because, well, tragic as the circumstances were, no one was particularly taking German claims at face value at that point. And, well... Yeah, the Russians didn't have any particular reason to say, yes, we just accidentally killed off several thousand ir relatively innocent people. Um, so, yeah, it's certainly not pleasant. I, it's one of those things, actually like doing the video on the, on the Franklin, which it, it takes a while to get your head around just the scale of the tragedy. So I think I'll probably leave it there other than with a commitment and a mark there that it is going to be its own video at some point. And that wraps up the Patreon part. So hopefully people enjoyed that, um, the our sort of alternate history theoretical part of the Patreon Dry Docs. And it's certainly uh, a lot easier on me, to be perfectly honest. Um, moths blasted things. Um, right, so, where are we? John Don Ho uh, asks, any positive stories about Japanese intelligence during World War II? Uh, depends whose side you're on. <laughs> if you're lo looking on the Japanese side, they had a few intelligence coups. But relatively few and far between as compared to uh, what, what they ended up looking at with yeah with all the various code breaks and everything that they suffered off the top of my head i can't think of any immediately off the top of my head but i know there were a few in um that they they actually got very very right which cost the allies quite a bit um amruth anad thank you very much uh, it just says love your work os os no, that's not Osprey. That's Osperi28 says, What are your favourite spirits? Ooh. Absinthe. Um, an Irish whiskey, because uh, I can't remember what it's called right now. It's a bit odd, but it's very, very smooth. I don't tend to like a lot of the Scotch whiskies because they're a bit too harsh, but... Um, Irish whiskies I've found, for some reason, are really smooth. Um, if you get a really good one, and I know this is going to sound really weird, but I am, it almost feels like what I'd imagine drinking liquid mercury is like, in that it almost seems to just stay together as a smooth rolling element as it slips down your throat. So I really like Irish whiskies. Um, Kraken rum, and another recent rum acquisition I've come across recently, but Kraken rum's quite good with, uh, as a mixer. Belgian absinthe is fun. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever been on the Eurostar, but the Eurostar uh, train that goes under the the Channel Tunnel, or through the Channel Tunnel, I should say, under the Channel, um, it has this weird, very gentle rocking motion 
like a ship at sea, but at much higher speed. And when you accidentally drink a bit too much absinthe and you're on the Eurostar back from Bruges, that rocking motion gets really weird. Um, and obviously this Maker's Mark 46 that's been kindly sent to me. Um, Rogue Leader, when will we get a video about the Battle of the Malacca Strait? At some point, as I said before, if there's a battle, if there's a major ba naval battle, or even a relatively minor naval battle that's got a decent amount of uh, sources be behind it so we can work out what vaguely happened, um, then I will cover it at some point. The fun one is going to be the Battle of the Yalu River because no two accounts agree, and there's a lot of them. Um, that Battle of the... When I eventually get around to doing the Battle of the Yalu River, I'm going to uh, just turn around and go, right, everyone disagrees about what happens here. This is what I think is probably the most likely, which is just going to add more confusion to the mess because it's going to be yet another interpretation of what happened there. Oh, that, that, that battle was a mess. Um, Animal16365 Who would win in a 1v1 A Brooklyn class or a Megami class Pre-heavy cruiser conversion The Brooklyn class Because the Brooklyn class isn't made of paper <laughs> I mean the, yeah The Megami class could get a torpedo spread in And that would end the fight pretty quickly Because the Brooklyn's not going to stand up to a spread of long lances If it gets hit badly But in a full on gunfight the Brooklyn is, with six inch guns, the Brooklyn is much better set up to both withstand punishment and deal out the punishment, as I say, on the grounds that it's not made of paper and hope in, the, in an attempt to fool the treaties. <laughs> so, yeah. The Megami could use its superior speed to try and run away, but that's technically a loss. Um, of course, they're, 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 you've always got the fog of war. Things can happen. Things can happen. Um, blogs, blogs, two light cruisers. Oh, oh, this is a 40k question. Two light cruisers or a lunar class and a frigate or a gothic and a destroyer or dictator and reasons. Depends on fighting. If I'm on long range sector recon, I'm going to take the two light cruisers. Um, gothic class is an all lance battery ship. I don't want to have that with just a destroyer. Um... A Lunar class and a frigate is a decent, solid patrol group. I do like my Nova cannons, though. So, yeah. Of, of those choices, I'd go with a Lunar class and a frigate because it's the m most all-round. And if I can get a Firestorm, that gives me extra lance firepower. Um, but yeah, if I can get something with a Nova cannon, I'd, I'd go for that because I like my Nova cannons. Admiral Tiberius asks, with your increased naval budget, you could jumpstart the Essex Swarm and change history. Imagine Coral Sea with two armoured Essexes in a Yorktown. It's true. It's very true. Um, how I'd get that through politically would be an interesting one. But yes, that, that would be especially fun. Um, so, right, where are we? Da, 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 da. So yes, so for, so if you want to ask a question, if you find blogs, blogs, and Admiral Tiberius's questions, that's roughly as far up as the question slider will let me see at the moment, because um, it's just done one of its big jumps. So yeah, I can answer questions below that, but unless the YouTube question thingy starts to behave itself again. Um, um, I can't see much higher than that. I can just about see a part of Salimo's question above, and that's basically it. Incidentally, Salimo asks, in case, case questions asked in chat, um, who do you think is a better tactician, Admiral Yi Sun Sin or Admiral Nelson? Um, ooh. For demonstrated tactics in the face of the enemy... I based on, because the thing is, you you could always make all sorts of theorems about what they could have done. But based on the variety of tactics, I would actually probably go for Admiral Yi Sun Sin. That's not to say Nelson didn't have good tactics, he definitely did, but his main tactic, as we've seen from the first of the uh, the three-part series on Admiral Nelson, his main tactic was attack, 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 
which was a very good tactic because he could get away with it most of the time with the French and the Spanish opposition at the time. But if you go attack, attack, attack when you've got the Korean Navy ships versus the Japanese at the time of Yi Sun Shin, that's a very easy way to lose a lot of ships. Um, as actually some of his some of um, Yi Sun Shin's contemporaries found out when they were put in charge instead of him. Um, so yeah, um, for for Demon for Admiral Yi Sun Shin had to had to be more creative because of the circumstances he was in. So from demon demonstrable capabilities he had he displayed a wider range of tactics. Um obviously if you reverse the two situations, Yi Sun Shinsen was aggress plenty aggressive enough if you put him in Nelson's place. The big question mark over in my head would be if he's confront if he's given a markedly inferior force like Admiral Yi had to deal with, how would Nelson react? And that's going to be... A, we don't know that. So, uh, Creed Guardsman 9788, out of curiosity, will you ever cover the German anti-shipping guided weapons like Fritz X? Yeah, probably at some point. They're related to naval strike quite a bit. Um, and do you think you'll have... What, what do you think a Fritz X would do to a CV? Nothing good. Although, weirdly enough, given the relatively light protection of most carriers, even the British armoured ones, a Fritz X is actually relatively likely to do what it did to Warspite and just punch all the way through out the bottom and explode very deep underwater where it doesn't actually do that much damage compared to what it could have done. So, yeah, that's... That would be um, an interesting scenario. Uh, but yeah, I think actually... Of all the major capital units you could throw a Fritz X at, Fritz X at the uh, CV would, the carrier would probably be one of the least efficient ways of, of using that weapon. They're actually just too powerful. <laughs> um, okay. Sorry, the YouTube questions thing decided to spaz out again, but I've managed to get back to where it was. Um, Style Runner, can you describe in general what aircraft stowage facilities on battleships and cruisers were like? Depended very much on the Navy. Um, all, pretty much almost every ship that carried aircraft had to have some form of secure storage for them because air aircraft turn, to, turn out to be quite fragile things in the face of things like storms. So, yeah, um... A lot of them had hangars. The British approach generally was in a midships hangar. The Italians and to a certain extent the Japanese quite often had hangars aft um, under the main deck as opposed to the British who tended to have the hangars as part of the superstructure. The Americans also stored their aircraft aft in most cases. Uh, the French had that um, had a variety of aircraft storage um, solutions, uh, some, mostly, again, aft launching and with rear hangars, although on the later designs, because of the concerns with rear blast, obviously they went with the internal hangars as well. Um, so, yeah, it, it, it varies very much from Navy to Navy, but basically they have to have some form of enclose, enclosure even if that means folding the aircraft up carrier style, which smaller ships like uh, the Deutschland class and the various cruisers would do. Uh, God Emperor of Mankind, HMS Glorious in Fisher form, i.e. with the 15-inch guns versus Graf Spey. Graf Spey. Glorious can run around, run away, but it's made, well, actually both sides, neither side can withstand the shells of the other, but Glorious even less so because it's got a very flimsy hull. And with the best one in the world, two twin 15 inch, it's just not enough. It's not, it's not. <laughs> you, 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 again, it's going to be difficult to get proper ranging and salvo accuracy off of it. And with the various modifications that would have been had to, had to have been stuck onto it to get to a point where it could fight Graf Spey in the in 1930s, 19, late 1930s, early 1940s, I don't want to think what the whole structure would have been like at that point with additional AA and radar and such like. 
Ahmed Ed Aris, how would a Russian fleet made at the end of World War II to compete with the UK US navies look like? What ship designs would be prominent and is the Kremlin in World of Warships a viable design? The Russians had problems when it came to building the building warships. I mean, to a certain extent we know what their cruiser fleet would look like, it's just spared love copy paste everywhere. Um they had real problems trying to get a viable carrier design and we as we know they couldn't really do battleship armor in viable thicknesses so they could have some big things like Sovetsky Soyuz which of course they were building some of but I have a suspicion they would be very inefficient uh, designs I mean they got the um, they adopted a form of the Italian torpedo defense system the Bugliese system and got it wrong so that would <laughs> that would have rendered them a bit vulnerable and yeah layered armor that that well, they wasn't good in the American Civil War era. It's not good in World War Two. Um, as far as the Kremlin in World of Warships, I don't. I haven't looked into that enough to give an opinion one way or the other. Josh Thomas Moore in a previous video said a task force going down the fjord to attack Tirpitz wouldn't work because no ship could survive a full salvo from Tirpitz's guns. Does that include the Yamatos? At the kind of range they're going down the fjord, yes. Um, I mean, yeah, fair enough. The, the German guns probably aren't going to go through the Yamato's um, turret face armor, but at the kind of ranges you'd be talking about if they're coming around a corner into Tirpitz's little hiding place, either in Tromso Fjord or Alton, uh, or Alton Fjord, however you pronounce it, at that range, it's the guns are going to go through practically anything, and they're going to they're going to be spot on target. I mean, y Yamato might have the size to absorb those hits and keep on coming, but I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to be the person to risk that. A blue fever. What happened to HMS Victory when she returned from the Battle of Trafalgar? Um, lots of repairs <laughs> is the short answer. Lots and lots of repairs. They, they, they had a they, there was a lot of work to do there there's a quite a famous painting actually of victory being towed away and you can see in just how battered a shape she was in um and the fact she had to be towed gives you an idea of of how bad a shape i mean fair enough most of it was because her rigging and sails been turned to swiss g's but uh whole wise she was still reasonably intact but yeah that there, there was a lot of repairs um Rodrigo Goncalve asks, was Admiral Cunningham the best British Admiral of World War II? Overall, probably. Almost certainly. Um, he made mistakes, as every Admiral does. He had great successes, as every, every Admiral does. Um, but partially because he had so much active career time in some of the most vital theatres, he has one of the best records you could make a, i mean the thing is it also depends on what what you're putting him in charge of there are admirals who will do better than cunningham if you put them in charge of destroyer flotillas there are admirals who might do better than cunningham if you put them purely in charge of carrier strike groups there are very few admirals i can think of who would do better than cunningham when given a fleet and told you have to fight against the odds for several years um William Kruger, you often said you could get Bismarck's capabilities on less tonnage, so now you do it backwards. With Bismarck's tonnage staying the same, how much better can you make it if it's if you make it more efficient? <laughs> oh, um, I managed to get a slightly superior ship to Bismarck on thirty-eight thousand tons at one point. Um, if I'll have some point I have to dig that design back up again. So if I'm left with Bismarck's original tonnage, I could make a monster. I mean, just revising the armor scheme, you could probably. I mean, on the on the tonnage that Bismarck had, if you're making it more efficient, you could probably get an armor scheme that where the belt thickness matches the thickness of the King George the Fifth's and probably covers a wider area, and make a far superior secondary battery. Stick a bit of armored tubing on the primary fire control data feeds for goodness sake, and <laughs> so you don't lose them quite so easily. Um, Personally, I'd save some weight 
for other systems by ditching the conning tower as well because actually much like the Royal Navy they didn't actually ever end up using it so it turns out to be a bit of a useless dead weight um, yeah I to making it more efficient I could keep the speed massively increase its armor armor protection massively increase the efficiency of its secondary batteries and increase the survivability of its fire control systems i think it would be it would be a properly scary ship at that point um io2 what if u.s navy battleships sail out on december the 6th for an exercise with full escorts and come across the japanese navy task force what would happen nothing good nothing good by a long shot that would be very worrying. Um, we oh. um, sorry, the questions just jumped. But yeah, assuming that that happens, the thing is, the U.S. battle line out of Pearl Harbor can't break twenty-one knots. The escorts can. The battleships can't. Kido Butai can just go bye. Um, and they've got almost a, almost a ten knot speed advantage. They just skedaddle off into the sunset, and um, suddenly you've now got early World War One and limited anti aircraft batteries against the, well the same kind of strike force you see at Pearl Harbor. They're not recovering the ships this time, and there's no USAF um, land based support in terms of AA and such like. So yeah. Um, 5101 and then a bunch of Japanese symbols has uh, seems to have been asking multiple times Tirpitz versus Hood excuse me um, Tirpitz versus Hood suggests that Hood survived and if Hood survives Hood gets a refit so the more proper question is Tirpitz versus refit Hood um Turpitz versus Refit Hood. Now that would be a battle for the ages. Hmm. I genuinely have no idea. Because by the time Hood's out of Refit, Turpitz has radar, probably, yeah, almost certainly has at least radar informed, if not radar guided, fire control, as would Hood. Um. Hood will have the latest Admiralty fire control table. Tirpitz will have the Germans' latest fire control systems. Um, Armour-wise, Hood's got it will have a much enlarged inclined 12-inch belt, which effectiveness-wise is about the same as Tirpitz's. They're probably going to stick supercharges in Hood's guns. So penetration-wise near as much as makes no difference at gun accuracy wise near as much as makes no difference speed wise full engine refit again near as much as makes no difference Turpitz has torpedoes but if you two ships get into torpedo range of each other something's gone badly wrong um hood's going to have a superior secondary battery probably 10 twin 4.5 inch turrets but that's not going to be that much of an issue to be perfectly honest in a one-on-one, -on -one, I'd be it'd be tossing a coin to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, both. I mean, but reasonable battle ranges. Both sides can pound their living daylights out of each other. Um, about the on, about the only thing that might be a slight deciding factor is that, as far as I'm aware, they never corrected the fault with um, the main fire control systems not having armored cabling down to the armored deck. That the bit which was a problem that was present on the Bismarck, and if they haven't done that, then the one sort of the one thing that you could say is is slightly decisively in the Hood's favour is the fact that uh, if the Hood scores a hit anywhere on or near the forward superstructure or mainmast, it's a very high chance that that Tirpitz loses its primary fire control and has to rely just on the local fire control. And when that happens. Then at that point, Hood has all of the advantages. 
because, well, it can shoot at straight and turpits no longer can. But that is really counting on a hit occurring in a very specific place at a very specific time. Scott Lock, the Mighty Jingles gave you a shout out in one of his videos. I know. <laughs> the Mighty Jingles is an excellent man. He also has a beard. This is one of the ways you can tell excellent men when they have British accents and have beards. You may have noticed a theme. <laughs> um, da -da -da. Commander Unnamed. I asked a what-if question on Patreon about what if the US strike force Kimmel sent to Wake hadn't been ordered to turn back by the acting replacement. And that is being asked, answered in the Patreon uh, dry dock on Sunday. Or for you, on Saturday. Or possibly tonight, depending on when I uh, release it early to the Patreons. Because that is based on a historical order that was given. And so it's, mu it, it's much easier to determine... Um, possible outcomes from research as opposed to the more theoretical questions we've been answering tonight. Um, do, 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 do. Fifth hand, how powerful was the Soviet Navy pre-Barbarossa? Not much. Um, the Soviet and now Russian and previous to being Soviet Ru Russian navies always have this eternal problem of they've got to deal with ships in their northern fleet, ships in the Baltic fleet, ships in the Black Sea, and ships in the Pacific. So they've effectively got to build four fleets, and outside of some very exceptional circumstances where possibly the Baltic and North northern fleets can support each other, they're basically in complete isolation. Um, so, for example, at the time of Operation Barbarossa, one of the things that actually raised on the World of Warships naval parade stream was why the the Russians didn't get a lot of their modern destroyers working on convoy escort duties, and a lot of the technical aspects were covered there. But one of the other factors is most of the Russian destroyers just weren't available for it. Um, a lot of the Russian modern destroyers were built, but some were in the Baltic, and I have a feeling Germany is going to have some words with them if they try and get <laughs> get out into the North Sea via the Denmark. Um, and a bunch of others were in the Black Sea, and well, yeah. If if you thought getting destroyers from the Baltic to Murmansk was difficult, try sailing them through the Dardanelles, through the Mediterranean, around the Atlantic, and up through across the Arctic. Um, yeah. Uh, da -da. Ooh, oh, uh, skips. Stop skipping, you stupid thing. Um, Andy Jim 17, Congo versus Prince of Wales. Um, that's pretty much hands down Prince of Wales, to be perfectly honest. Um, on, largely on the grounds that Prince of Wales actually has meaningful protection against Congo shells, uh, not to mention radar and decent fire control. Um, Congo has a decent optical fire control, but doesn't have radar, so it's a disadvantage in a bunch of weather conditions, which is a very familiar theme you might find with a lot of Allied versus Japanese battleship comparisons. And, yeah, Congo's armour, when it comes to resisting Prince of Wales' shots, is basically... Ha, thanks for activating the fuse. Um, her horn player asks, with the proposed US 5.4-inch 48 dual-purpose gun have suffered from the same issues as the Royal Navy 5.25 inch or would the US developments in dual purpose mounts lead to a more initially successful weapon system? Hmm. It could have, depending on the shell weight, but then US Navy shells outside of the Super Heavies tend to be slightly lighter than their Royal Navy counterparts. Um, for example, the 4.5 inch British shell was almost the same as the American five inch 38 shells it's despite the half inch extra caliber so it's possible the 5.4 inch shell might have been slightly lighter than the 5.25s which would have helped a lot of the 5.25s in inches problems was the size of the mounting it was too cramped um the revised size mountings you got on vanguard solved a lot of those problems and there were some machinery issues as well so assuming that the u.s navy builds um, maybe something like more of the boxy design like they built for the twin mounts for the 5 inch 38 yeah, they probably do better 
they might still suffer from some issues with new weapons you can never really tell but I suspect they probably would have suffered with them from slightly fewer teething troubles um, John Don Ho how about selling Kamchatka World Tour t-shirts at some point <laughs> maybe yeah um, I'd have to I'd have to come up with a uh, there's a few ships that I could sell World Tour t-shirts for but I'd have to have the time to think over over exactly which ones and how to display them um, Eric Johansson could composite armor and guided shells have extended the usefulness of battleships at least in some form or at least some form of armored warships not particularly the battleship as I've said before wasn't made obsolete by it not having sufficient offensive power or having sufficient defenses a battleship even in 1945 was infinitely more survivable than a carrier and could hit a hell of a lot harder at close range the problem was range not firepower um, carrier could hit you hundreds of miles away and without any real risk to itself unless you happen to have aircraft to strike back a battleship has to get a lot closer and so just making it more protected and making it more able to accurately hit the targets doesn't really help it match the engagement range that's ca you're capable of getting off of a carrier and yeah to be perfectly honest there's not really any conflicts post um 1945 where that would really come into play in the 50s and 60s everyone's thinking nukes and the solid steel armor of the battleships is fine for that. Um, maybe it would have helped conceptualize some kind of defenses if their composite armor offers enough strength against some of the more esoteric weapons that were being used, so gu big guided missiles and such. But there's only a limited amount you can do against that with fancy materials tech. Uh, at some point, you just ha you also have to just look at sheer mass to stop some of the really heavy stuff because yeah i don't care what kind of fancy composites you've got if you've only got six to eight inches of the stuff on your deck if someone drops something like say a rocket assisted tall boy which was a bomb they had under discussion at one point uh, that ain't gonna help Cody 85 considering how much we pick on here in kirishima how far down the line do we have to go to find a u.s battleship they can fight Oof. <laughs> Arkansas? <laughs> um, the problem is that the Congos don't have armor that can withstand anything that the, any of the US battle line have. Even Arkansas's 12 inch guns will quite happily make a mess of a Congo class. I mean, the less refitted and unrefitted standards, probably, because. The ones with the lesser quality radar um, and the ones that weren't fully modernized, the 14-inch gun-armed ones, in certain circumstances, here yeah, in Kirishima can probably give them a straight fight um, with speed dictating range and such. But it's, it's going to be difficult. It's going to be hard. Um... Miles McCaskill asks, Yamato versus Bismarck and Tirpitz as launched in daytime in good weather. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna give it to the Germans because both sides have excellent optical fire control. Um, well, Bismarck demonstrated that easily enough. Um, yeah, at which point it's a two v one. So. Whichever, I mean, Yamato shells are going to do a real number on whichever, whatever it hits. But the other ship has basically free target practice and their guns and fire control systems are accurate enough that it won't take them too long to start hitting Yamato. And once they start hitting Yamato, they're going to mess enough of, I think it'll mess enough parts of the ship up to start diminishing its ability to fire back, even if they're not completely wrecking it. And once again, kind of the inverse of Bismarck's last stand, once Yamato can't fire back well enough, it's, it's 
just time and whether or not whichever one of Bismarck and Terps is picked on first succumbs to the damage that the 18 inch shells do. Ian Wookie Win Ian Wookie Winter asks would the Royal Navy have been better off if it cancelled the R class and built three more Queen Elizabeth and four more renowns? Hmm. Probably. Yeah. I mean, three more Queen Elizabeth, if they can modernise them to some degree, and four more renowns. I mean, the, well, the thing is, it's. If they built the improved renowns that they wanted to build after the actual renowns, that would certainly help quite considerably. Um, four more renown as designed. They don't have that much spare armor plate <laughs> for the emergency refits. So I'd say with four more improved renowns and three more Queen Elizabeth, then yeah, that's great. But they only ended up building five R-class. So uh, I suppose I suppose if you if you lump the two actual renowns that were built into those four more renowns, then yeah, that'd be good. That'd be good. Um, bum, 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 bum. Fern Paz, non-military naval historical event you think more people should be exposed to? If you mean by non-wartime, the Fourth Fleet incident. The Fourth Fleet incident is a perfect lesson in how not to build ships and why you should not keep trying to make everything lighter. Sooner or later, things start breaking. The sea is a cruel mistress and will break things if you don't build them well enough. Um... Stephen Bond, how would the Deutschlands compare if they'd been built as heavy cruisers? I presume with a hipper type armament. Uh, actually, to be honest, probably not brilliantly. Compa compared to the hippers, they'd be slower. It's basically, be same armament, slightly better protection, but much slower, which kind of obviates the problem with heavy cruisers, um, which is that they're quick. Creek Guardsman 978. Eight. Had Germany been allowed to keep Der Flinger or one of her sisters, how do you think this would change ship design going into World War II at all, since they have experience with more modern warships compared to what they had historically? Um, well, if they've been allowed to keep Der Flinger, that just, that's just their existing ship design expertise. Um, the interesting thing would have been if they put Der Flinger through the kind of refits that Schliessen and Schleswig-Holstein, or however the heck that thing is pronounced, um, then that would be really fun. A modernized diff, a really heavily modernized diff flinger, ironically enough, will probably actually be a more capable battle unit than the Scharnhorsts, which in turn might actually affect how the Scharnhorsts are built, to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, that, that would be fun. Actually, that kind of links in with that question about wouldn't the Royal Navy have been better off with more Queen Elizabeths and Renowns than the R's? Because you can guarantee with the Deaf Linger around, they'd be desperately scrambling to upgrade any Renowns they could get their hands on to, to counter them. Um. <laughs> da, 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 da. Brian Nicholas, question. How would USS Maine have fared at Manila Bay, assuming it had survived? Um, probably not going to hit anything. Not that hitting it. I mean, gun accuracy in the Spanish-American War was awful anyway, but partly that was down to particular training and gunnery regiments, but partly that was just the period. Um, long range, as I kind of covered in the in the, the gunnery systems of fire control and plotting, etc. earlier this week. Um... The Spanish-American War happened just when guns were able to reach out long distances and people wanted to use those distances, but just before the fire control revolution that I believe it was Admiral Smith in the U.S. Navy. Was it Smith or Sims? I can't remember. It began with S anyway. But he brought in a bunch of gunnery fire control um, revolutions in the immediate aftermath of the Spanish-American War. So, yeah, they had the worst of both worlds at the, in that particular thing. Maine... 
It's slow. It's under an underarm for a battleship. It's overarm for an armored cruiser, but still slower. So it probably just get left behind, much like a bunch of the other other ships did. Um, I can't see it doing anything particularly stand out. The Ash 274 has any significant warships sunk upon launch and had to be refloated to be completed. I know a few ships launches have gone badly and they've had to salvage them. I can't think of warships sunk on launch straight off hand. I know a bunch a few warships have been sunk shortly after launch and then been refloated and reused one of the Royal Navy's T-class submarines, for example. But off the top of my head, I can't think of anything that any warship was chucked down the slipway to watch it go straight under and have to be refloated. Um, Nikolai Lucic, L-U-C-Y-K, however you pronounce that. Your thoughts on Cochrane, the uh, La Lou de, Mer, de la Mer, um, and were you a fan of the Sharp series? I was a fan of the Sharp series, actually. Um... I mean, for crying out loud, they managed to find a combination of people who could keep Sean Bean alive for more than 15 minutes on screen. That alone makes them worthy of note. Um, as far as Cochrane goes, he was a little bit mad. Um, as I've said, I think someone asked a question at one point about like, what would happen if Royal Navy officers were displaced into the World War One, World War Two era... And my immediate thought with Admiral Cochrane would be he would look around and go, ooh, many big and shiny, well, in his terms, iron ships. His next question would be, how do I board one? Um, and ironically enough, his plan of sail under the enemy guns would probably actually work. Da, da, da. S uh, scooter... GSP asks, do we know anything about the captain and crew of Kamchatka to explain why they behaved the way they did, or was the ship simply crewed by a group of escaped mental patients? I haven't managed to come across a lot specifically about the Kamchatka. They're mentioned in a, in a few of the various writings that were um, put down by various um, Russian crew and that survived, obviously not from the Kamchatka itself. But the thing is, you've got to remember the Russian fleet of the early 1900s was not a happy place at all. Um, and they'd conscripted in a bunch of people who had basically no idea what they were doing for um, a, a lot of their ships. And that was on the warships. So if you think they probably would have put the, the quote-unquote prize pick on the warship. So... Yeah, think think about some of the problems they had on the warships, and then think right. And those were, and then they sent the B or the C team into the into the supply ships and the back and the other repair ships and such. Like, mix that in with the massive political discontent and revolutionary feelings. I, I deeply suspect they probably just a lot of them just either didn't care or were actively out to sabotage things. Um, yeah. If you, if you want nightmare cruise from hell, from if you're opening up to any time period, the early 1900s Russian Navy is a very good place to pick some of the worst. Um, there's not there's not many navies where you can point to multiple spontaneous mutinies <laughs> for, for for multiple different reasons. Da, da, da. Battle of the Turret Farms. Agincourt versus Wyoming versus Fuso. Who wins? Probably Fuso. It's got the heavier guns. Um, the thing is, between Fuso and Wyoming, armor is broadly similar. Fuso's slightly faster and has heavier guns. Agincourt, much as it has ridiculous numbers of guns, also has basically battle cruiser grade armor and not a lot of other internal protection. So, um,. Much as I love it, unless Agincourt managed to, to land an absolutely devastating broadside, um, as circumstances had it in the uh, theoretical Battle of the Texel, um, any prolonged gunfight Agincourt actually gets engaged in is probably not going to go very well for her. Um, Frank Sposato asks, If a British Taffy 3 was present with their respective escort carriers, destroyers and destroyer escorts, what might that have been like? More aggressive, more firepower, etc. Hmm. 
Ooh, Fletcher class, Fletcher class DDs. What's the British equivalent? With the Fletcher class, it's going to be a toss up between the tribals and the NOPs, etc. Era when roll wise. Escort carriers, well, there's a lot of shared designs, they're probably going to be pretty similar. And actually, yeah, the air complement's going to be pretty similar as well. Um, destroy escorts, so you're probably talking about something like a hunt class. Um, so, surface gun power wise, the a British Tappy 3 is probably going to have slightly more surface gun power because the 5 inch 38 is is an excellent dual purpose weapon but it's an okay it's only really an okay-ish anti-surface weapon uh the higher velocity 4.7 and 4.5 inch guns on the british destroyers and destroyer escorts are slightly more suited for that particular type of action um the i mean you're talking late war so you're talking about radar fire control and good fire control on on all sides um the thing is if it's the m if it's an mnop type then torpedo wise it's again it's similar to the fletchers firepower wise there's one extra gun with the tribals you've got three extra guns which is going to stand them in good stead for plastering the enemy with with firepower but they've also only got one quad launcher which means some of the torpedo hits that the historical tappy three scored they might not get um escort carriers as i say they're pretty, almost exactly the same so is that so that's a bit of a wash um the thing is that the, the tribals are obviously as a lot of you probably know very aggressive but then again how do you get more aggressive than captain evans about the only way i mean captain evans was ridiculously aggressive and very smart about how he played it which to be fair a lot of the tribal captains were as well but the only i think the only way you could get more aggressive than captain evans would basically be to ram something um which uh i can i mean if, if they got close enough they might try it um about the only thing i can think of that the that a tribal might a tribal or two might try that Captain Evans didn't try would maybe be <clears throat> a full-scale, high-speed, maximum effort, high 30 knots plus run straight at a battleship to try and ram their quad torpedo launcher down their throat. But quite how successful that would have been. Whilst I can see them trying it, I don't know whether they would have survived long enough to get into launch range. Would have been interesting to see, though. Eric Johansson, would railguns set a dangerous precedent if they are nuclear reactor powered? Would they legitimize the use of nuclear weapons in return, assuming that they actually work? No. Um, I mean, technically speaking, nuclear powered aircraft carriers, the aircraft are nuclear powered because the, launch, the um, catapults use power, ultimately, the... the, the steam pressure and everything and now the emails all that power ultimately roots from the nuclear reactors and nobody well nobody thinks using nuclear weapons on an aircraft carrier is acceptable because of that there are other reasons you might use nuclear weapons on an aircraft carrier but not because the power plant is indirectly contributing to the ship's firepower directly and the same thing with railguns it's it's electricity at the end of the day, they're not firing nuclear shells. Um, USNC forward on to no UNSC, sorry, forward on to dawn. Um, who do you think would win a battle between refooted hood against Congo and Haruna, circa 1944? Hmm. Depends on the circumstances. In an open daylight engagement, um, sort of flat, calm, open seas. I would actually give the two Congos a slight edge because, again, it's 2v1. Hood can engage. I mean, theoretically, Hood could engage both, maybe one with its four turrets, one with its aft turrets, but that would be a bit, you know, be a bit questionable. Hood can definitely beat down one of them pretty quickly, 
Um, and with it, if it's refitted with its armor, it can certainly withstand a reasonable amount of punishment from the Congo's guns, especially at range. But ultimately, yeah, decent optical fire control on the Japanese part in open seas. It's relatively likely that whichever one is unengaged will start getting hits. And it's, it's, in a lot of ways, it's almost similar to Yamato versus Bismarck and Tirpitz. Um, put it in rough seas, misty conditions, fog, night, bad weather of some kind, and then I'd give Hood the advantage because the Congo and Haddon, I don't have the radar-guarded fire control that Hood would have at that point. So at that point, it would be advantage Hood. And, of course, if Hood gets in a couple of good early salvos and cripples one, then it's back to a one-on-one -on -one fight, but you can't bet on that. Um... Graham Arras, have you been in charge of the Grand Fleet and secured the victory you described recently at Jutland? That would be in the last live stream. What impact do you think such a defeat would have had on the post-war Navy? Um, or such a defeat of Germany, I suppose, you're asking. Um, it would have put the Navy stock a lot higher up. Um, the Navy post... World War One had obviously to argue a lot with the Royal Air Force. They lost control of the fleet air arm. Aircraft were seen as the thing of the future. Um, and so although the Navy was vital to maintaining the Empire, it did have to make a lot of argument as to whether or not it was still the frontline defence of the Empire, given that its most notable impacts on the outcome of World War I were more passive in, to, in terms of things like the blockade. Um, with a definitive victory like the one I hypothesized could have been done at Jutland, it doesn't have to make that argument anywhere near, nearly as badly and probably actually keeps the fleet air arm under its control. Because it can make a well, it doesn't have to make a stronger case. It is a stronger case for defending the empire as the front line. Um, so, and obviously morale is going to be a lot higher going in. Um, the one interesting counterfactual about that, though, is that I mean, if I'm in charge, I'm still going to drive them to fight night action because. That's probably where most of the Royal Navy's losses are going to be, be coming around. Um, and a lot of vulnerabilities. But it's possible within the general political context that a victory like that, they might not quite see the same need to develop their night fighting skills. Which could come back to bite them quite badly in World War II for politicians and the, the culture doesn't allow for it. <clears throat> um, Redshirt 214, what are your thoughts on the idea of a mortar-armed Western River Squadron riverboat in the US Civil War? Should it be an ironclad or unarmoured? Um, if you're talking about river iron warfare in the American Civil War, it needs to be armoured. Because, well, you're on a river! People are going to be shooting at you. And, well, we can see from various uh, encounters during the American Civil War, such as with, even say, like the fight that Galena got involved in, just exactly what happens when you put an unarmoured or effectively unarmoured ship up against a shore battery that's well, well dug in. Um, if you're going to be fighting riverine warfare in, in the American Civil War, it needs to, you need protection. <laughs> or, if you don't, you need to be behind a line of ships that does. Um, PC Intify asks, do you feel what the captain of I-58 of I said was correct, uh, which was that given a clear moonlit l l night, he could easily sink the Indianapolis, even if it was zigzagging? Um... Broadly speaking, probably, because Indianapolis was completely unescorted, so unless it saw I-58, then I-58 is going to have time to set up its attack, and it can set up its attack on bearings for immediately after Indianapolis completes a zigzag. Um, 
Obviously the zigzagging does add a little bit of an extra difficulty to the equation, but unescorted cruiser in the middle of the ocean, there's a limited amount it can do when it has no idea that there's a submarine even there. <laughs> Derp Squad says, building a new Northern European Navy in the mid 1920s um, but a traitor, how would you compromise the Navy without making it obvious? E.g. no German style light cruisers and destroyers falling apart in waves. Um, basically, I think, are you asking how basically how I sabotage a Northern European Navy in the mid 1920s? Um, hmm. How do you compromise things without making it obvious? Okay, there's... Okay, there's one definite way I can think of that wouldn't be obvious, but would would really um, do do a Navy in, which would be to... Hmm. Yeah, I would aim to reduce ships' speeds by making it by basically making a big song and dance about the vulnerability of ships to torpedoes and mines, and insist that ships have mass basically have massive bulges and torpedo defenses. And when people point out that's going to massively slow down the ships, I would say, "Yep, okay. Well, then we have to reinvent the tumble home." to reduce weight so we can reduce width so we can keep the ships um, at a reasonable speed. So you're going to end up with some really weird tumble home style ships with massive torpedo protection and slightly slow speeds as a result, which is going to A, be a problem in World War II because speed becomes something rather important, and two, <laughs> Tumble home holes are kind of leave basically no deck space for anti-aircraft weaponry. So by the time World War II rolls around and you can't fit much AA guns on the thing, there's going to be a lot of a lot of problems at that point. Um, Staz Sakay, I think, says, I started following Dr. Alexander Clark recently. Good for you. Um, so now I have a question. What is the magic between a deep comprehensive knowledge of naval history and a high level of iron brew consumption? Um, I think it's because iron brew is made of girders and girders are made of steel and ships are made of steel and therefore by ingesting the iron brew, part, you become theoretically part steel, which maybe gives you a quantum level interaction with warships you can understand their structure and also it contains ridiculous amounts of sugar so you can keep studying for ages <laughs> uh, those would be my philosophical thoughts on iron brew um do, do, do. what's this <laughs> Osper A28 says, what's the relationship between iron brew and military history knowledge? Was, I think that's basically what I just said, isn't it? <laughs> um, it? It does seem to be a very common drink amongst people who like naval history. Um, to be honest, I think part of it might come from the fact that a lot of naval history in, in the UK involves Scotland when you're talking about late 19th early 20th century because of the shipyards and naval bases which means at some point you're going to end up doing research which involves visiting scotland and when you do visit scotland there is no escaping the iron brew and once it's got its lovely orange liquid claws into you yeah you're, you're, you're kind of stuck at that point <laughs> Kent Barnes asks, have you read the Destroyman series by Taylor Anderson? Um, yes, it's alternate history sci-fi, but an interesting exercise in building a military from the Bronze Age up to the late 1930s. I have not. I've seen a few of the books, but um, I, I think I saw the books 
about two or three years ago. And then I looked, I thought, well, it vaguely looks interesting. And then I saw how many of them there were and went, I really don't have the time. Um, I know they're out on audiobook format and I am working my way through my audiobook collection. I built up a really nice audiobook collection. I swore off listening to them for a couple of months in preparation for my America trip. Um, yeah, that went well. So now I'm working my way through those. So at some point, um, I may have to see if I, I might download one of the like the first one on audio book and see if that if it if it catches my interest. The thing is, I'm always a little bit leery of the kind of time displaced people go all the way back and start building things up and changing history and everything because um it involves two very different periods and sometimes more periods in history and it's very rare you'll find someone who's an author and actually has a deep understanding of all those periods of history and how they will how the effects will butterfly out and to be perfectly honest a lot of them time it serves as kind of a oh look at the look at these time displaced people from this particular nation or whatever look how awesome they are etc um yeah i mean there's a i can't remember what the series is called but it basically deploys a like a relatively modern american town back to the 1600s or something like that i really didn't like that um I'm not saying that's what the Destroyer, se Destroyer series is like, but that's that's how a lot of those kinds of stories I've seen end up going. So I'd say I'll, I'll give the first book a shot at some point um, and and see how I go from there. Uh, NBA Random asks, how much better would three Lexington-class battlecruisers do in the Battle of Jutland in place of Lion, Indefatigable, and Queen Mary? Hmm. Their armor's not f f brilliant, so um, yeah, they're certainly not better protected. They're a lot faster. The problem is there's only three of them, so if they use their speed, they're going to get massively outnumbered by the high seas fleet. And if they stick with the rest of the fleet, well, then their speed isn't really much help um they've got much heavier guns which is good and they've got 1920s fire control assuming they're time displaced so that's definitely going to give them a bit of an advantage and of course their shells are less likely to explode on contact so they're probably going to do well they're probably they're definitely going to do significantly better because they're probably going to start landing hits and landing really nasty hits much earlier i just wouldn't necessarily count them as particularly survivable if if the Germans start landing hits in return. Well, I suppose at the same time they do have a lot more mass to absorb hits as long as it doesn't hit anything particularly vital. Um, uh, William Cox asks, Many Type 21 U-boats were lost during training in the North Sea. What was its major flaw at the time? Um... There were a number of flaws that were typical of a relatively revolutionary type of um, ship design that, that's completely changing the, how, how a t particular type of warship works. And that's going to be difficult for anybody. I mean, you look at the post-war experiments with things like hydrogen peroxide propulsion and such like and see how many accidents there were there. And that's with fairly well-trained crews. The, the, the Type 21 suffered the problem of their brand new ship type. They work in a very different way to the older U-boats. And we're talking about the late war Kriegsmarine, where a lot of their best U-boat crews have been sunk. And there there is an overall quality degradation going on. So you've got relatively inexperienced, relatively speaking, people trying to operate brand new technology in an environment that's not really conducive to um, a lot of a lot of deep carefully considered learning and 
yeah, shockingly, you end up with a lot of uh, a lot of things going wrong and casualties. Okay, something's going on interesting with the question section. I'm going to leave that to resolve itself until it um, sorts itself out. Kevin McTaggart, should we laugh at how bad of a crew Kemchatka had knowing how they died? Um, see, the thing is, with, with stuff like that, the way I tend to treat it is I'm not necessarily laughing at the crew themselves, but at the 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 hor horrific series of things they ended up getting wrong it's yeah it, it's a it's a fine line but i'd say it's perfect i would say it's perfectly fine to have a good laugh at the expense of a ship that got a lot of things wrong um you're, you're mocking the outcomes basically as opposed to directly mocking the crew themselves um yeah, I think I think that's basically how I would treat things. I mean, this is why sometimes you, I do see comments in some videos saying, "Oh, you should take things more seriously. You should um, like cause people died and everything." And it's like, well, I'd like to think I'd take things seriously when it is merited and when it needs to be taken seriously. But at the end of the day, whether or not, well, mope with the. With the best one in the world, at the end of the day, those people are dead now. Um, and I would prefer to think that, you know, when, when you're in these kinds of situations, like even when you're looking at something like the Franklin where the ship didn't die, you look at some of the stuff that the crews went through and you don't know whether to laugh or cry. You're going to do one of the two. And I'd certainly like to think that for those people and then this is based a lot on my own experiences talking to my great uncles before they passed on and what they said about their friends and what they said about their own experiences as well which is that at the end of the day as long as you're not being disrespectful to the men you're not mocking them um nastily then a lot of servicemen would probably much rather you remembered their escapades before they died with a smile on your face and a laugh in your heart than being really depressed and and, and moping about them i mean yeah a lot of there's a lot of gallows humor that goes on in the military and you can understand why um but yeah I, I do I do definitely remember that as well, um my the the oldest of my great uncles the one who served in the Royal Air Force he definitely said a lot of his a lot of his friends that he didn't end up seeing again after various missions over Germany in 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 the Lancasters he said they definitely all had the opinion that they would rather their various screw ups and escapades and various incidents they got involved in before they went on their final flight they'd much rather those things be remembered with a good laugh and around at the pub than everyone else getting really teared up every time you mention them so yeah I, I try and take that approach generally when it comes to these things um, don't be unnecessarily nasty to the crew or the captains unless they did something unforgivably stupid um, and yeah, just 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 roll with it as best you can. I mean, it's sometimes it's a, it's a difficult balance to to strike, but I try and do my best with that. Cody eighty five. The U.S. Navy replaces the Russian Navy ship for ship versus the Japanese at the Battle of Tsushima. Um, Nineteen oh four. Hmm. The U.S. Navy is probably going to do a lot better. They've got the, they're beginning to get the fire control rev 
revolution through at that point, even though it's only half a decade down the line from the Spanish-American War, so their shooting's going to be much better. Design-wise, or choices about sticking twin 8-inch turrets on top of the main battery aside, their overall design philosophy is slightly better, and assuming that they're somehow getting over there, they're probably going to be in significantly better shape than the Russians, because... They quote unquote only have to stage their way across the entirety of the Pacific instead of all the way down the Atlantic and across the Indian and up the Pacific. So they're they're overall going to be in a lot better shape and with a better quality of crew, and say with with better better quality um, armament as well. So they're 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 going to do a lot a lot better than the Russians, I think. Um, the only question to my mind is how the tactics go in actual fact to be perfectly honest with the fact the u.s navy is going to have better discipline and slightly faster ships and more able to respond to orders accurately they could actually punish the japanese quite badly because the japanese only really got away with some of the maneuvers in the opening stages of the battle because the russians were so disorganized if togo pulls off those same kind of tactics and the us and you have a us navy to force there they're probably going to be able to counter a lot a lot more nastily i mean when the japanese fleet doesn't about and historically that's where they take most of their hits from the russians i can see a us navy actually crippling a number of japanese ships in the turn and then causing the japanese ship to pile up and break up at which point it's every man for himself and i'm beginning to lose my voice Jay Illingworth, how much extra horsepower would a Nelson need to make a usable World War II speed? They could go... Uh, uh, an emergency power, they could go surprisingly fast. Um, it's not 100% documented, but there's a lot of sources from the period that seem to indicate that even on its half-broken boilers, um, Rodney was clocking 25-ish knots on its final run into Bismarck. There was a lot of overload capacity in those ships. Not that it did the engines any favours, but they knew they were going to the USA for a refit afterwards anyway, so whatever. Um, how... To be honest, I don't think it's so much a problem of extra horsepower, it's more a problem of length. The hulls are designed for a certain speed, and everything's crammed in quite tightly. They To get a lot of extra horsepower, they'd either need a complete engine refit, which might get them an extra knot or two, if they go one-for-one one replacement with much more modern engines in the late 1930s. Um, at which point that might give them an extra 10 to any thousand horsepower. But the engine, the power plant isn't that big, and they would probably run into cavitation issues with the propellers, so they need You'd need to chop out a section and lengthen them to get, well, A, a better hull form for higher speed and more space for the engines. Um, believe it or not, it's actually getting slightly cold now. <laughs> um, uh, I don't know. Um... Give me two seconds. I'm just going to close some of the doors and windows so I don't start shivering uncontrollably. There we go. Um, da, 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 da. Coltax 100, how would the Hindenburgs fare in World War Two? Well, Hindenburg was a dare flinger, so I refer you back to my answer about the dare flingers. Um, <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, and that's another massive jump. Um, Kevin Kennelly asks, I'm reading Norman Friedman for the first time. Is there a support group for such undertakings? <laughs> yeah, um, Norman Friedman books contain a huge amount of information. They're really useful in that regard. On the other hand, as you say, <laughs> they can be very information dense. So yeah, there's, pro there's probably a support group on the Discord or something that can help you through that. Um, they're huge. They're hugely informative if you can make your way around the various um, aspects of them. And the, the the extended footnotes at the back are absolutely wonderful. Um, all the extra information that's in involved there. But yeah, there's there's a lot. There's a lot to undertake there. He's got a very particular writing style. I like it very much because, well, as an engineer, you just like, oh, yes, look, loads of technical information. Absorb, absorb, absorb. Um, but that's probably just me. Um, right. So just I'm probably going to wrap things up in about 10 minutes or so, but I do need to close another window because that breeze is getting actually quite chilly. I shall be back momentarily. I also ended up finding one of my medieval reenactment cloaks, so that's handy. It'll keep me a bit warmer. Um, <laughs> also the light's fading, so that's another reason to wrap things up in about 10 minutes or so. Um, doo -doo -doo. Right, so uh, 10 minutes, so let's try and get a few questions answered. Oh, let me pull that back in so we've got a bit more audio. Um, Talkie Walkie Meet Pete, <laughs> that is an excellent name. Um, what do you make of the German reports of torpedoes in the water at Denmark Strait? Could Hood have even launched torpedoes at that angle? Yeah, this, I kind of covered this in the video I did on Operation Rheinabung. Yes, I think for whatever reason, Hood did launch torpedoes. Um, the, the the hydrophone operators on the German ships were very good. Um, they, I mean, they used the hydrophones to know that the Royal Navy was coming before they saw them. So if the hydrophone operators say they heard torpedoes, um, and I think some of them said, even said they spotted them, then I'm going to believe them. Uh, the the sound effects of a torpedo in that kind of engagement are very distinct. I I honestly don't see how they could have mistaken them. Hood could have launched torpedoes. Um, she had uh, broadside mounted torpedo launchers, but the torpedoes could be set to turn a certain amount immediately after launch. So the angle's not a problem. And at the, if you backtrack from the time that Prince Eugen reports the torpedoes to when it were that when they theoretically would have been launched, it does just about fall within the range. 
and the timings if of of uh, British torpedoes as fitted to Hood. So there's there's nothing there's nothing particularly ag- that says anything against the Hood launching the torpedoes, except for the fact that the survivors' accounts don't mention them. But then again, there were only three survivors, and it's possible that they i mean even the one the, even the one who was on the bridge doesn't wouldn't or near the bridge doesn't necessarily hear overhear all the orders or it could have been a local decision that was made maybe if there was some kind of fire nearby well we know there are a couple of fires on the decks already maybe the the torpedo launch uh, crew decided to get rid of some torpedoes off their own initiative just in case Uh. Coltex 100 what if the Kidu Batai sunk the Doolittle task force um, that'd be an interesting feat <laughs> considering where they were relative to the Doolittle task force you'd have to wonder what kind of teleportation technology they've developed um, I mean if they do it's that you down Hornet and Enterprise that's very bad for the US Navy, especially at that time. Um, it's going to affect the outcome of other battles because obviously Enterprise isn't there. But uh, um, the main problem to, with that scenario, to be honest, is just finding finding out how the Kido Batai teleport back. <laughs> um, Redshirt214, you're in charge of the US Navy post Civil War. Uh, what do you scrap, keep, buy, or build? Um, Hmm. I'm going to ditch pretty much all of the monitors. I try and retain some of the better screw frigates. I mean, Congress is going to slash the funding so much. I try and keep new Ironsides around as much as possible. Um, what I'd probably actually do was, would be to take as much as I can from the US Navy uh, budget and actually offer the offer Congress an even more ambitious scrapping scheme and try and reuse some of those funds to build a small squadron say three or four modern ocean going broadside or center battery ironclads and give the US Navy an, a, a proper ocean going force um, going going forward possibly with an eye towards I mean given how many turrets uh, were around at that point maybe even go for a turret ship a few turret ships um but yeah give the give the u.s navy some kind of ocean going deterrence force so they don't have to panic quite so much about the brazilians and the chileans and everybody else once they start buying actual ocean going warships um i think that's fire in the first asks third savo with norman scott in command instead of callahan <laughs> um, that would be something I'd have to look at in a video on Third Savo as as, a, as an alternate option, because there's so there's so many there's so many factors going on in all of the Savo Island battles that, um, yeah, try trying to pull trying to pull uh, this this admiral that admiral, you you have to with a with a big complex battle like the series at Savo Island. You have to look in. You have to go into that in a, so much more detail um, to come up with a, with anything approaching a something better than a random guesstimate. Um, well, okay. There's a bit of a jump there. What's going on? Um, Santiago Trujillo Tobon, um, I'm making a cardboard model of a World War One dreadnought. What would you recommend? Preferably a ship that doesn't get much attention, since I'd like those. If you want a ship that doesn't get a lot of attention, go for HMS Erin. <laughs> yeah, Virch, this is like the 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 ex the, the the bigger of the two ex Ottoman battleships. Virtually nobody ever says that much about Erin, um, but she's a fun ship to design to do a, a, a build of. 
Um, a Sintra Ross, very stylish cloak. Is it wool or what? Yes, it is. It's um, it's wool on the outside. Um, I can't remember if the lining's cotton or linen, but it's very comfortable and warm. And <laughs> you can tell the light is fading pretty quickly, which is just so. Awesome. I've got three minutes to go. Let's try and um, pull a few more questions. <laughs> Nick Walters account. One, two, three. Ah, ah, ah. Yes. Count on count. Um, <clears throat> da, 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 da. William Cox repeating. Compare SeaTact to Japanese Type 13 and 21 and Italian GUFO radar. Uh, SeaTact is, well, covers a few different radars. The, the Germans keep coming up with weird and wonderful names to to classify their radar types by, but the GUFO radar, if it was properly developed, probably superior but then again it was put on hold of the gufo at the time that it was kind of put on ice for a bit was inferior to SeaTac, but it eventually would come out superior um i'd actually say the sea is probably a gent flat out better than the japanese radars in its later formats um the japanese radars weren't a lot to write home about um Archangel Glenn, what's your take on the Montana class as a whole when compared to their contemporaries? They don't really have any contemporaries. Um, the closest you get to the con to contemporary to the Montana class would either be the Super Yamatos, which are their old, whole own special little kettle of fish. And, well, the Lion, the later versions of the Lion class. And much as I do love the Lion class... Any realistic lion class design is 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 on a whole different level compared to the Montanas. The Montanas are much bigger, much more heavily armed, etc. Montana doesn't really have a contemporary or an equal, to be perfectly honest, because the the Royal Navy really got seriously into designing a ship of that size, and um, yeah, and that was, and they were pretty much the only people who were designing ships at that point seriously. Rembrandt 972, they've invented these things called artificial lights. Yes, they have. However, I haven't actually got around to installing powerful enough ones in the conservatory yet. And also my voice is beginning to go. So, uh, I I mean, I, I will have artificial lights later um, for when I need to do this again. But hey, there's a cozy kind of firelight effect going on at the moment for the next minute or two. Um... Bum, 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 bum. Where's that come? Okay. Uh, Putin the Frog, apparently. Okay. Uh, hello, comrade. Asks, the Clemson's single 76mm AA gun aft lacked any um, VT shells during uh, even World War II, if my info is correct. Why not at least have limited production? 76mm uh, is 3 inch. Probably size, to be perfectly honest. It's much easier to fit a VT fuse in a 5-inch shell than a 3-inch shell, basically, is what it comes down to. Um, and with so many 5-inch shells out there, it's it just makes more sense to just batch mass and batch produce them for that kind of caliber. Uh, I mean, to be perfectly honest, by the time VT shells came around and um, proximity fuse shells, etc., if you're sending a Clemson with a single three inch AA gun in, you've done something monstrously, monstrously wrong because the US Navy has so many better options at that point for sending in destroyers. It's like, why? Um, Nagato 2044 asks, what if all the great navies have a Mutsu scenario in 1940? Which ships would you choose? Well, which ships would I choose to spontaneously explode? Um, 
If I'm trying to be kind to the various navies, I'd probably choose ships they're going to shortly lose anyway. <laughs> so that would be what something like something like Barham for the Royal Navy, um, Arizona for the U.S. Navy, Nisenor or Nisenau for the Germans. If I wanted to be particularly cruel and twist the knife in those respective navies, then actually I'm not sure blowing up Bismarck. Actually, you know, blowing up Bismarck would be a very cruel twist for the Germans because they'd be back to having Scharnhorst and they pretty much lose Nisenor or Nisenau pretty quickly. Um, and Hood is still around at that point. So that really, really messes the Germans up. Um, for the Royal Navy... In 1940, probably King George V... And for the U.S. Navy, probably Washington, if you want to really twist the knife in those navies with a Mutsu-type spontaneous destruction scenario. And that's 2132, so I'm going to wrap it up with one last question. And what shall we... What shall we answer as our very, very last question? Um, apologies to those of you I haven't managed to get an answer to, but unfortunately with at one point oh, just over a thousand people watching, there's no way, human way I can catch up and answer everything. Um, okay, so I'm going to wrap up with... Okay, I'm going to wrap up with this one. Scooter GSP asks, if you were going to make a movie about the Russian Second Pacific Fleet, who would you cast to play the role of Admiral Rosesvensky? I know exactly who I'd cast if I can get, if he's still willing to do so. Brian Blessed. Because Brian Blessed in the role of Admiral Rosesvensky would be possibly the single most hilarious thing I've seen on any kind of historical based movie in all of recorded history. It would be awesome beyond imagining. <laughs> oh, I, I can I can see it in my head right now. I really I really can. <laughs> And with that wonderful mental image, um, yes, with that wonderful mental image in mind, I shall uh, I shall see everyone at some other point in a video. And because everyone's commenting on the Dracula-esque nature, good night, everybody. Sleep well. <laughs>